This video is on stationary waves um, and is the last part of the waves module. So we need to consider um, how stationary waves are formed, the differences between stationary waves and progressive waves, which is the type of wave that we've talked about for everything up to this point, and then define the terms node and antinode. We'll then talk about station wave experiments and station waves for longitudinal um, waves. So, progressive versus stationary. You should remember that a progressive wave uh, transfers energy from one point to another. A stationary wave, um, the energy is stored rather than transmitted by the oscillation. So, if we look at a station uh, progressive wave, what you can see is that as time goes on, the peak will travel uh, from left to right as time moves. So if you consider any point on this wave, for example this point here, at some time it will uh, oscillate and will reach the maximum oscillation, the maximum displacement, um, which is the amplitude. So every point on this wave will have the same amplitude at some point, even though at a particular time it may have a different displacement. In a stationary wave, there is no movement of the wave from left to right. Um, the peak stays in the same place. So if we consider a point here now on the wave, this will never oscillate uh, at a displacement greater uh, than what is shown there. So it will only oscillate between these two points, which is different to, say, this point in the centre, which will oscillate um, for the maximum still. And so each point on a stationary wave has a different amplitude. We also sometimes call stationary waves standing waves, and those two terms are, all, to all intents and purposes, interchangeable. So a progressive wave transfers energy, a stationary wave, the energy is stored. So in terms of the way they are formed, stationary waves are formed when two coherent progressive waves of the same frequency travel in opposite directions. So we can see in this first diagram we've got the red and the green waves moving in opposite directions. The resultant is the purple. And you can see that at this particular point every point on the wave has got a, a displacement of zero. As time goes on, the way the phase difference between the waves changes, and so we get. The, whereas here we had destructive interference, we will now get constructive interference. Now, if we analyse a specific um, point on this wave, if we consider this um, point here, for example, and if we compare this point at all of the different times, so we're looking down here. So we're looking at the purple line at this time here. So you can see at the start obviously the displacement is zero. Even after the phase difference though, this point still has a displacement of zero and again at this point it still has a displacement of zero and the same is there. If we compare this point on each of the waves you will see that despite uh, it having a displacement of zero at t equals zero and t equals half the period at a quarter and three quarters, you can see the oscillation is at a maximum because of constructive interference in both directions. So we've got this oscillating peak up and down at this point uh, and this uh, node at this point. So the phase difference you and path difference you should be able to recognize for each of these. So obviously the phase difference here is uh, pi. Here it's uh, 2 pi. And again, here it's pi and 2 pi because of constructive and destructive interference. In terms of lambda, we should remember destructive interference is half values of lambda, uh, and constructive is whole values of lambda. So, node and antinodes. So this is the shape that we get for a stationary wave. And the node corresponds to a point of no displacement. So those are the zero points on, this, on the wave. And the antinode corresponds to a point of uh, maximum... Uh, displacement, so amplitude. Um, so we've got nodes and antinodes on our wave. Now if we consider, we know one full wavelength is the distance between there to there, that means the distance between two nodes corresponds to half a wavelength as shown in the diagram. The distance between two antinodes again would also correspond to a distance of half a wavelength. 
So that means the distance between a node and an antinode corresponds to lambda over 4, quarter of a wavelength. So the resultant wave is uh, where the displacement is 0. Those points are called nodes. Where the displacement varies between a maximum, and maximum positive and negative value, we call that an antinode. And at a node, the points in a stationary wave that uh, have no displacement of the particles at any time. At an antinode, the displacement of the particles is varying at its maximum. So, and then we've summarised the distances between nodes and antinodes. So, between a node and antinode is quarter of a wavelength, or between two adjacent nodes or two adjacent antinodes is half a wavelength. This then moves us on to stationary wave experiments. So there are three types, effectively. We need to understand experiments using microwaves, stretch springs, and then also um, tubes um, for sound, which we'll move on to next. So we need to analyse the wave pattern in both of these cases and understand what we mean by fundamental modes of vibration. So if we think about the microwave example first, the way you would do an experiment with the microwave is you need a microwave transmitter and you need an object to reflect the microwave. So a metal sheet will do this. So the wave, the incident wave will travel and will reflect off the metal sheet and then will um, reflect back um, and will interfere with the incident wave. So the reflected wave interferes interferes with the incident wave, and so we get a standing wave form, um, neater than what I've drawn. Um, but what we could then do is move the detector along, and we could measure maximums that correspond to antinodes, and minimums which can't correspond to nodes. So we'd, we'd be able to detect that change in intensity. So as an example, if we'd knew the distance between the first maximum and the 23rd, that co would correspond to uh, 22 uh, half wavelengths, because the maximum only correspond to uh, the antinodes, and obviously the distance between two antinodes is half lambda. So there would be 11 wavelengths in that gap, and so if this distance corresponds to 11 wavelengths, we could divide that by 11 to work out the wavelength and then times that by the frequency to give us the speed which would obviously give us the speed of light it's more accurate to measure lots of the distance between several maximum minimum and divide it uh, because it's a more accurate method of, method of measurement as opposed to just measuring the distance between two uh, maxima so if we think about strings now when you pluck a string you generate a stationary wave because you generate an incident wave which travels down uh, and on a string the two ends are fixed so that means you have to have two nodes at each end so when you get the sanding wave if the wave you produce has a wavelength that is half um, which is sorry which is equal to a wavelength which is equal to double the distance between these two points we know the distance between these two points is uh, half uh, a wavelength. So you get the wave travelling to here, it's the first half, and then it reflects back. And so it will interfere with itself, and this produces uh, a vibration on the string which we observe. Now this is what we call a resonant vibration, and it corresponds to a specific note. So this will occur at a specific frequency. And the frequency is governed by the mass per unit length of the string, or, or the material, the tension and the length of the string. So the f simplest mode of vibration, the simplest vibration that can happen is when the length of the string is half of the wavelength of the note. So this is our fundamental mode of vibration. We could equally get a more complex mode of vibration where we've got several um, oscillations. So each oscillation is known as a harmonic. So our um, fundamental mode of vibration or the first harmonic corresponds to when the length of the string is half the wavelength. In this case, the length of the string is one wavelength, and that's our first overtone or second harmonic, and so on. So you need to be able to recognize these patterns for waves on a string, and recognize that what happens with each of these is the frequency increases. So F naught, this would have a double the frequency, this would have triple, and this would have four times the frequency. So this. Um, 
you can see that in this picture showing these modes of vibration very very clearly so if we think about this uh, for example uh, we have an equation that links the fundamental mode um, uh, frequency uh, 1 over 2 times the length times the square root of tension over mass per unit uh, length you're not asked to remember you're not asked to use this equation in your exam unless they give it to you but uh, and you're not given it but it is useful to be aware of to help you remember these three components so if this um, was oscillating at 180 hertz because this is the third harmonic the frequency of this is effectively 3 f naught and f naught is the fundamental frequency so the fundamental frequency would be this the 180 divided by 3 so it would be 60 um, if we then think about the other example, we've then got stationary waves in pipes. Now this is different and two things we need to be aware of. When we got it on a string, we always had a node at one end and a node at the other. With a pipe, what we have is we can have a closed pipe where one end uh, must be a node. So if one end of the, the pipe is closed, like so, one end is closed and this must correspond to a node. The open end will always correspond to an antinode because um, the par air particles can move at this point in and out of the pipe. So the simplest mode of vibration you could have for this would look like that. So you've got an antinode and a node. If you've got it open at both ends, then that means you would have two antinodes at each end. So if we show this in a slightly uh, easier way so this is our closed pipe this would be our simplest mode of vibration for a, clo a pipe closed at one end because we know we have to have a node and an anti-node that distance we know would be uh, lambda over four because the distance between a node and an anti-node is a quarter of lambda we then couldn't get w uh, a stationary wave that it corresponds to a frequency that's double this where it's corris where the length is half of the wavelength because then we'd have to have two nodes at each end so when we've got w uh, a tube that's closed at one end, we only get odd harmonics. So zero, uh, F0, zero, uh, three, F0, five, F0. So that can be generated simply by blowing over the end of the tube or moving the air. Okay. Then if we've got a tube that's open at both ends, then that means we have to now have an antinode at each end. So the fundamental frequency would look like so. Uh, so the wave pattern that would uh, occur beyond that would correspond to would correspond to that, and then you would add uh, a harmonic each time in the middle. And again, you can have every uh, frequency of f naught for two open end tubes, so f naught, two f naught, three f naught, etc. As long as it is an integral number, okay? So it must be a whole number. So the wavelength would correspond to two l over n and you can derive the formula for the frequency by recognizing that uh, the wave speed is frequency times uh, lambda so uh, this equation if you divide this by uh, c divided by this um, you would end up to get an equation for frequency that was n v which is the wave speed which for sound not c sorry because it's not a light wave uh, and then uh, divided by 2 l this resonance effect can be seen um, to be quite destructive when it's at the maximum. This is an example of a uh, Tokuyama bridge um, undergoing resonance that's led to its destruction. So to sort of summarise, the particles at the nodes and antinodes in a longitudinal wave, um, there is a largest pressure difference uh, at the antinodes. So if you look uh, at where we've got the antinode, this is where the particles are oscillating the most. That is corresponds to the biggest uh, difference in air pressure. So, uh, on a uh, antinode, the pressure is at the largest on a closed end tube. At a node, the pressure is uh, is lowest because the particles aren't moving at that point. And this just summarizes a lot of the things we've just talked about with stationary waves. If there's anything you don't understand about stationary waves, just make sure you ask and clarify with your teacher.